Mm. Okay, we're in. Good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome to our second installment of our partnership with the National Trust for Scotland, Naked Wines. And we are live on Facebook as well as Zoom. So wherever you are, Scotland or further south, uh, welcome. And you may already have some of the wines that we'll be tasting this evening. And if you don't, well, you can get them. They'll be shared in a link which we'll have in the chat room down below. And everything. The, obviously, every case we Naked Wines is contributing 20% of the proceeds back to the National Trust Conservation, Nature Conservation. So um, get involved, please, everyone. We have a chat room down below there just to so tell us where you are, what you're drinking. And, and then later in this session, we'll do a Q&A where you can share any thoughts that you pick up along from this discussion. And I'll be, I'll be selecting some of the questions and putting it to our panelists and I welcome our panelists first of all Antonio good evening you're in hi are you no are you in Scotland currently I am I'm actually on Loch Leven right now well I'm not on Loch Leven I'm beside Loch Leven beautiful and is it as cold there as it is in the very yeah, south of England? it's actually look sunny you always get the best weather in Scotland it has to yeah. Be, yeah it's lovely and Charles and Ruth Simpson, winemakers uh, based in France and based in Kent in England. Good evening. And where in the world are you? Good evening, Ray. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're actually at home in Kent uh, today, mm -hmm. uh, but we're just back from Saint Rose. So we, we made the crossing back from France on okay. Saturday. So we're sort of <clears throat> foot in each place. But tonight we're in Kent. Lovely stuff. Did you have to do a number of PCR tests, etc. We've et done five in a week. Yeah. So more to go. Yeah, the, the nostrils are very clean, <laughs> as are the tonsils at this stage of the game. Moving on swiftly. So we we um yeah. So people are already joining and and uh, contributing to the chat room, which is always what I personally love about these Thursday Tuesday sessions is the community that builds up and. Um, I don't know, it's a sense of place where you know you're with like-minded people. But tonight we're going to specifically talk about National Trust for Scotland sites and in particular uh, the Georgian House. But also we'll go back a little bit through the history and uh, talk about some of the characters and some of the food and some of the wine and some of the trade and so on at that time. So because it's four minutes past eight on a Tuesday night and the sun is finally out, I personally could do with a glass of wine. So why don't we start off with some wine and then we'll go and talk about some of the culture and history in Scotland. So here we go. So the first wine we are going to taste, Biora, English sparkling wine. So this is Charles and Ruth wine from Kent. So as I'm popping it and you're digesting it, can you please tell us what we should expect Tell us a bit about it and, and the vineyard that you've established there in England. Thank you. Mm. So firstly, cheers, everyone. Yep. Cheers. Happy, happy Tuesday. Um, so tonight, obviously, we've got um, mm. we're go three wines. Uh, two are from France and one are from the UK. So this is the only uh, English wine that we're showing tonight, but a very special wine and a very naked centric wine, dare I say it, because this concept, you know, really came through through a lot of support from Naked Angels back in 20, 2016. So many of you will know that we've been making wine in France since 2002, but we brought that sort of know-how and savoir faire back to the UK in 2012. We started planting vineyards in 14. First harvest was 2016. And what you've got in front of you is our second ever harvest. Um, so our second ever vintage uh, that we made for Biora. In terms of the year itself, and Ray, I know you'll remember this very well, we, we got um, horribly frosted. Now that's dreadful from a business perspective, but actually very good as a consumer because what it gives you is concentration. So this is, um, in terms of the blend, it, what, first, of all, first and foremost, it's a metal traditional sparkling wine. So it's bottle fermented, unlike Prosecco. So the, the bubbles form naturally through a secondary fermentation in the bottle. It's from our vineyard in Kent, which is just south uh, of Canterbury. And the blend is 80% <coughs> Chardonnay and 20% Pinot Noir. It's had 15 months on lees and was disgorged about two years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you don't mind me saying, it is beautifully wonderful. It's got what they called a little bit of yeast autolysis. So that sort of bready brioche dimension on the nose, but also some lovely sort of citrus characters um, coming through. Let me have a taste. Yeah. That bready yeasty character you talk is like, yeah, brioche, fresh baked, baked bread, that kind of character you said when you walk into a French 
bakery. Um, no, you get that. It's a, it's, a, it's a peculiar aroma, but it's here in, in the wine. Yeah, mm. and it just it adds com complexity uh, to, to the wine. So palette-wise, it's sort of um, lime, lemon curd. But one of the wonderful things that also yeast autolysis does is gives you this lovely long finish. Yum. Yum, yum, yum. So I know tonight, Ray, we're going to be talking about like food pairings and, and what have you. I mean, obviously this can be served as an aperitif, but it's got structure, it's got elegance, it's got um, you know, a lot going on in the mouth. And, and so oftentimes we'd actually pair this with a very English dish, one you might've heard of called fish and chips. And actually it pairs incredibly well, you know, that sort of acidity that cuts through deep fried um, battered fish and, and, and chips. But, you know, also delicate salmon, um, fruit pavlova. Yeah. So a myriad of things. And also, yeah, I suppose bringing it back to, you know, going on to talk about Georgian house in due course, if, you, if you're going to posh it up, you could do it. You could serve this with afternoon tea. I just love the idea of having this with fish and chips. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's Very great. Good. Living the Delicious. Dream. Thank you. And Ruth, you are yourself Scottish. Is that I right? Am, Can I you tell us? who the what the where and well i know the why but tell, tell us how <laughs> tell us from the beginning so where are you from ruth so i was born in inverness so a bit further north um up in the highlands my mum and dad were both from the sort of northeast so um they had more whiskey in the blood than wine um but uh but i was brought up in edinburgh so i you know i got to know the georgian house very well um, not only because, you know, it, it was an iconic property that we used to, you know, go visit, you know, with school and that sort of thing, but also my mum volunteered there. So, you know, during school holidays, I was sort of taken along and told to sit in the corner and be be quiet and not to interfere with the visitors walking through the house. But uh, yeah, I got to know it quite well. It's been a long time since I've been there since, but uh, yeah, I've got very fond memories. And I mean, that part of Edinburgh has developed a lot recently and it's still, it's still just a very beautiful part of town. That's and, uh, amazing. And yeah. My mum volunteered there as well. So she did the flowers for the Georgian house for about three or four years. Wow. And um, and actually the lady who runs the Georgian house is the best volunteer manager in the trust. I think she has some running like 200 volunteers at one time. She's, she's an incredible lady. So that's so brilliant that your mum, your, how long did she volunteer for? Oh, that's a very good question. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but she she not only volunteered there, but also at some um, private gardens, very beautiful gardens mm. in the in the Scottish borders near Melrose. So um, so she she uh, she divided her time a little bit and moved from moved in between a couple of properties. Yeah, Pride was NTS as well. Yeah, you can yeah. go visit that. I think it's open. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I wonder just at this point, as as people are settling in, and thank you for all the contribution in the chat. But if you just let us know how many of you or have you ever yet visited a National Trust for Scotland site? And uh, if you have, we'd love, you know, just let us know. And it'll, I think by the end of this evening, because I have had the, the fortune to speak to uh, everyone here this evening, I know I'll be going. I haven't been, but I will be going. So uh, let us know. We'll put up a poll shortly on the screen and then you can join in and let us know where you've been. And we will then I think we'll be able to, Antonia, if you can tell us a bit about um, the, the Georgian house, I'll, uh, we'll just get everyone to vote there. Actually, you, you, you panelists can do it. I, I was going to say, no, I haven't. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, can I just say that actually I have one of the best jobs in the entire world, except for obviously being a vintner, which must be excellent, except for you're much more beholden to the weather than I am. Um, and uh, except for when you go to properties, as a curator, you get to be there when nobody else is there, but you also get to be there when the heating's not on. So it's arctically cold. So <laughs> pluses uh, and minuses. Yeah, no, it is. I think that behind the scenes and roam where you like must be such a real privilege and sort of yeah. step inside behind the curtains and sort of get the underbelly of, um, of a history like that is incredible. You're very fortunate. Um, we have, um, oh, here we go. Okay, so, so far, 31% and lots of people saying that they are life members and thank you very much. And we will yeah. also touch on, you know, basically the past year, which has been very difficult for the income of, of the trust, but um, 31% are, and 60, you can expect 69% of people basically zooming up there as soon as I think, you know, everyone feels comfortable and confident to, to get about the country again. So 
Um, well, look, I think it'd be great if we could just get straight into talking about the trust and something. So I'm going to share my screen. And this is usually where you go, OK, you know, it's late. And did you prepare? So let's see. Let's have a go. I'm going to share my screen. And, and so if you could tell us a bit. Um, here. Yeah. So, yeah, I just well kind of welcome to Newtown Edinburgh. And we're sort of basing ourselves in about the 1790s, 1800s. And this was a time when wine was really in full flow in the new town. Um, it had actually been available in Scotland, like way, I mean, I'm really amazed at this. In 1480, there was an Aberdeen tavern that had the license to sell red Gascony wine, and it was sixpence a pint, which doesn't that sound great? A pint of wine for sixpence. Um, and there was a range of al alcoholic drinks available in taverns. And the other interesting thing, just um, over the city from the new town here at uh, Georgian House, is Gladstone's Land, which is the tenement property that was uh, running as a business from 1501. And in the basement of that was a tavern run by a woman. And we know her name, her name was Isabel Johnston. And so women really did run the ale houses of Edinburgh. But wine really um, grew in, in consumption in the early 17th century, and it was the wealthier families that could drink the wine because it was a lot more expensive than the ale. Um, and so when these houses were built in the 1780s and 1790s in the new town, wealthy families moved in and they started a fashion for entertaining in the home, which is what we all do now and what we've been doing for the last year haven't we because we've got anywhere else to go we've been entertaining ourselves in the home so this is the dining room of the georgian house which you might remember ruth um sitting in the corner reading a book maybe i don't know <laughs> um but let's just say we're in 1800 and you are invited to dinner with john lamont who's the guy who owns the place his wife and his daughters um, they've been at the property for about four years. They bought it in 1796 and they only bought it for £1,800, which is about relatively now 178 grand, which is still an amazing steal for a townhouse in Edinburgh. Um, but the butler, he got paid £20 a year. So you can see who could afford these kind of places. Um, and John Lamont was the chief. He was the chief of his clan and they were from Argyllshire. And he was wealthy enough to get Henry Rayburn to paint his portrait for him. And he moved there specifically because he had all these daughters and he needed to marry them off. And Edinburgh was the place to show off your daughters. Similar to the lovely Netflix show Bridgerton, this is what this interior would have been like. Lots of girls just crying their eyes out in their beds and trying to dress for the latest ball to get the right man. Um, and actually one of them did marry successfully in 1800. Um, he, she married a, a guy who was from the West Indies. Um, his, br his brother had actually been the governor of Jamaica um, and the governor of Madras, and they'd made their fortune in sugar and rum and, and the trade across the oceans. So you're, you're going to the Georgian house and you're going for dinner and it's 1800. You're greeted at the door by the butler. He takes your coat and your hat he leads you up the stairs to the formal reception room, which you're going to be offered a sherry here. This is where you have your sherry, which I still remember my grandmother offering me whenever I came. Can't stand sherry, just have to say. Here um, in the drawing room, so this is above the dining room, all the furniture is pushed back and you have what's called a promenade. So you walk about the room, all the candles are lit and everything blings off the gilt uh, mirrors and all the curtains are open so that everybody outside can see just what a wonderful time you're having. And they can see right in, they can see your fashions and your clothing, and they can gaze enviously at your party. So when you're called to dinner, you would go with the partner that you were given, because you were given a partner to go and sit next to your neighbor, and you went down. Now the table you can see in this picture, it's set for the period the soup tureen, the ashets, and the covered dishes are all in symmetrical order in the middle of the table. And the butler has polished the Sheffield plate and the table is together, it's not divided. If you went to a tea party here, this table would be in three or four different parts across the room. So you'd be sitting in different areas of the room. 
and then we've got the food would you like me to go on to the food tell or... us about the food and and what we what we can do is i will it's, it's an incredible image and thank you for sharing that with us i'm going to um stop that and then you can tell us um yeah, you know, tell us about the type of food that you would have eaten at that point. Yeah, I'm really intrigued. So this is this is really fascinating for me because I want to know what Charles and Ruth think, what kind of wines would pair. And I don't know if Charles and Ruth, you know, kind of at the time, um, what what wines would have been available. I've got some wines, but not in very much detail. So that'd be quite interesting. Um, so instead of the usual two large courses the guests would have lots of smaller courses so this is what changed um, at the beginning of the 1800s um, so lots of opportunity for lots of different wines so they would have soup game fish roast meat puddings desserts that kind of thing so you might start with something like a peas pottage soup which has got peas mint and spinach so what kind of wine would you have with that my goodness that sounds like it <laughs> You, you, you certainly get your greens out of that, really. Yeah, you would. Yes. I, I mean, I was thinking something like a, you know, like a roan white, mm. um, like a, it's like a, a, a more body. that's yeah. right, to get through yeah. the thickness of the pea soup, but a, a, a decent amount of acidity. So something like a Roussan, Marsan, Viognier, the Viognier's got some lovely oh, floral nice. dimensions that would really mm. lift, uh, it. lift yeah. it, you know, because yeah. pea soup could be a little bit subdued and what have you, but mm. that's what would, um, certainly jump out mm. to mind. And whether or not Rhone wines were heading that far south and those um, that far north in those days, I don't know. Certainly, you know, a, a Bordeaux wood, um, mm. yeah. uh, which was primarily back then a uh, mostly red, although now they do um, a fair amount of, of whites. But yes, that's what I would think if it was pea soup anyway. Yeah, certainly. Okay, and so next we have oysters with pickle and spice mm. oh. well actually you know the fiora that we just tasted and potentially yeah. even your blonde that we're going to taste next would be perfect for that absolutely yeah. perfect i, was I wish i had some here we would always suggest um shellfish uh, and obviously in scotland you get lot and and proximity to the sea means you're going to get mm -hmm. lots of lovely fresh mm -hmm. fresh shellfish so that absolutely would be the recommendation and again if you think about it how we normally serve mm -hmm. oysters or fresh oysters anyway is a lot of times with either vinegar or with a, a squeeze of lemon so the key to you know balance with an oyster is acidity so as mm -hmm. we said a sparkling wine or a really fresh and fruity white like a Sauvignon Blanc would be absolutely ideal. Would you would would you change it if it had lots of fresh pepper on it? Would that change things, or is that keeps things um, the same? Sorry. Not necessarily. No. no, no. Okay. Um, and then you've got your, one of your meat dishes. So we've got a venison cooked really slowly on a rotisserie down in the kitchen. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well. Ultimately, what we're going to taste as well, the syrup, I mean, I suppose in, back in that day, it probably would be, they would talk about the clarets, wouldn't they? They would be, it would be mm -hmm. you know, that historical trade, um, which stems right back from the, the old alliance, back sort of, you know, 12th, 13th century, that was, that was established, mm -hmm. uh, which meant that the Scottish merchants would get the first pick of some of the, the best Bordeaux wines and, and bring them over. Um, but uh, so I suppose that, you know, the Bordelais wines would be a little bit, a little bit lighter than perhaps the Syrah that we're, we're mm -hmm. um, going to taste a little bit later on. And that is actually where claret came from. So the first thing to say is no one, on, no one in the world understands what claret is other than us Brits. It was only us Brits that called Bordeaux claret. And my understanding is it stems from claret, which is like light colored wine. Mm -hmm. And I think Bordelais wine back in the sort of 11th century was, was quite insipid. Um, and they had to add like wines from Cahors and uh, um, um, those you know, more heavier body regions mm -hmm. to actually make the Bordeaux that we know uh, today. Um, but yes, so, so, so naturally that would, that mm -hmm. would be something you would absolutely see around the table. That's, the that's yeah, and that's really interesting because in the 1770s, apparently Edinburgh had more claret than England. Mm -hmm. You know, so Edinburgh was like a, had the port of Leith where all of the wine was coming in, they were exporting things like um, hides and horses and wool and bringing in spices and silks and wines. And claret was um, drunk more in taverns in the 1770 um, in, in Edinburgh than it was throughout England, mm. which is kind of an amazing kind of statistic. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think the trade switched a little bit. So there was more things like some of the, the fortified wines, the ports coming in from Portugal by that stage, wasn't there? So. No. yeah that's right yeah mm -hmm. yeah um what about uh, lamb 
Um, so you've got roast lamb. You yeah. definitely would have had that. Yeah, I mean, lamb, we always associate with, um, again, the southern French reds. And as we've already alluded, the, the red, one of the reds we'll be trying tonight, or the only red we'll try tonight, is a syrah. But something, you know, that's peppery and spicy, um, you know, herbaceous, um, uh, you know, down in our part of France, we always refer to this term called lagarie, which is all the herbs that naturally surround the Mediterranean landscape. And naturally, the belief is that grapes grow in, in the garrigue, you know, sort of pick up these aromatic thyme and rosemary, um, what the French would call terroir. So the, you know, the, the berries actually, you know, pick up aromatics associated with the fauna oh, and topography around them. Yeah. And, and, and wines that are based on Syrah, Grenache, Mouverde, even Carignan, go so well with lamb. You know, they're just, it's that lovely sort of peppery, mm. spicy dimension that balances so well, um, you know, with, 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 with lamb flavors. So, you know, we, that's always what we would, uh, um, pair with and certainly comes to mind. That's really interesting. This is really helpful. I'm actually writing all this down so I can do that myself. Um, so moving on to puddings, there's something called a lemon syllabub, which is made with cream and sugar. My mum used to make that. Yeah. yeah. yeah so that that was a really popular dish um, back in the, <laughs> Not in the 12th century. <laughs> no, your mum. She may have been in the 17th and 18th century, but I'm not sure she was old enough for the 12th century. <laughs> so that's more of a, uh, a sort of dairy-based dessert. So, um, you know, it, it, those are slightly more difficult. You I mean, you, the nat nat you wouldn't naturally go for a sweet wine necessarily with that because might, it might actually be too cloying with a, with a dairy-based dessert. So it may actually be that you, you want to go back to a sparkling, you know, yeah. and... Um, in the in the actually the mixed case that uh, that naked are offering there is there's actually a sparkling rosé from our from Saint Rose from our French property which mm. is really light and delicate and actually you know again would sort of lift that the uh, the lemon flavors of the of the uh, sort of more dairy based dessert it's almost like a palate cleanser kind of idea mm. yeah. yeah yeah I mean we actually think that dairy pairs better with white wines and actually red wines again uh, because of that acidity and you know so what so often when we, when we come if we're coming to cheese by the way so often people think of red wines and mm. think that that's the perfect combination but we'd actually disagree try it try a, a fresh uh, and and fruity and see even something like a chardonnay pairs really well with cheese because you want a little bit of that you know uh, low pH, high acidity to play with the fat mm -hmm. of, of certainly cheese and, and, and dairy. So sometimes the things that we, the old wives tales we get told about, well, this goes with this and this, this doesn't go with that. Or, you know, you can fall into a trap. And so, you, you know, the best thing to do is experiment, but certainly, yeah. you know, white wine's perfect with cheese. Perfect with cheese. Yeah. So, oh, this is something that I have this discussion with a German friend of mine who's in hospitality. And uh, so, who knows why British people do pudding and then cheese and that French do cheese and then pudding? What's the deal with that? Well, the French, we would, the, French yeah. the French one makes sense to me, sorry. Um, the French yeah. one makes sense to me because the idea is you say, you stay savoury mm -hmm. all the way through and then you hit it with that, uh, that sort of palate cleanser at the end of the meal. Whereas in Britain, we would go savoury, then we go sweet and then we go back to savoury. Yeah. Um, but do you know what my friend's explanation is for that? Go on. He's like, the French are lovers and they do not want to end their dinner with cheese. Ah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, that obviously explains why I always finish with, with dessert. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. It's because you're a lover, not a fighter, right? That's right. <laughs> right. Um, so then, actually, I don't have cheese. There's a couple of things here left. Um, preserved cherries and a baked raisin cake. Ooh. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you mean, you'd probably go to more fortified exactly. with that, I would yeah. have thought. Definitely. So whether, I mean, I guess at that time, would it be Madeira? Would it be Port? Would it... Um, what, what would be coming yes, in? Yes, Madeira the... and Port. Madeira was incredibly popular, I think, at the time because of the trade connections. Madeira was a kind of central um, point of trade for Americas and, and India. Um, so there were lots of stops off in, in Madeira, incredibly popular. And also because of, you mentioned this, Ruth, actually, in 1662, Charles II married Catherine of Braganza. And Hmm. All of a sudden, all of the kind of um, duties and taxes favoured the Portuguese. Hmm. Yeah. Funny that. And uh, and and the French, uh, the taxes didn't favour the French. 
And it was people like uh, David Hume, for instance, the philosopher based in Edinburgh. He was just, he raged in public um, in a kind of diatribe treaty saying, this is wrong, this is absolutely wrong. French wines are far superior than the Portuguese and the Spanish. And we we're having to deal with this ridiculous cheap wine that is making people um, heathens. Um, and we're more sophisticated than that, people, come on. Oh, which is quite interesting yeah and would they preserve the i mean the preserved cherries were they were they preserved in in what i mean were they in alcohol? Uh, they were pre i think um mostly it was sugar um they were i mean you imagine how incredibly expensive that would have been they would have, i think they would have preserved preserved them in sugar and some sort of alcohol whether it be um a bit of madeira or a bit of port but i, I think that would have been a little bit too expensive i imagine mm -hmm. Madeira sounds like it'd be perfect. You have this sort of, if you're talking about dried raisin cake, you, Madeira, the way it's made, it's sort of, it's purposefully heated. And, and so as in its elevage, as it's, as it's maturing. And so what you get is, I mean, I, I think it's one of, apart from Kent wine and wines from the Languedoc, I think it's one of the greatest <laughs> wines in the world. It, it really mm -hmm. is. And it, it, the, the complexity and the longevity and, and length is it's an incredible wine Madeira yeah. but purpose as soon as you said that I was like oh there you go that sort of raisin prune date yeah. mm -hmm. and then it, and as you said earlier Charles that the sort of acidity that goes through to, to lift yeah. so lovely I mean and so that is a fantastic vineyard into the the culinary life which we <laughs> all subliminally you know we don't obsess but we are very engaged you know from whatever's on television but you know just go also in the past year to sort of lighten up a bit of change um from day to day cooking home cooking um mm. or, or maybe having it delivered to you or, or however but uh just to look back 200 or so years ago and and, and see how, how it was then and i i think what we'll do is we'll just you you'll all be drinking your own respective bottles at home uh, or you may not um but what we're going to do is we're going to taste the second wine now, which is, um, this is from France. This is from Charles and Roots um, property in France, Simpsons of Serbia, and it's Sauvignon Blanc 2020 last year, a year to forget, but this wine hopefully will be delicious and memorable. So what we'll do is we'll taste this and then we'll go back because I'm fascinated a bit more about George House and George and House, and you could tell us as well, Antonia. So Ruth, Charles, your Sauvignon Blanc, from France, can you give us a sort of a an insight on, or also just tell us about your your setup in France as well, briefly? Yeah, I mean very briefly. Uh, um, in France, Domaine Saint Rose, we um, we've been making growing grapes and making wine down there since two thousand and two. So actually, we are as of the end of this month. It's been it was been nineteen years since we first moved in, and we're heading into our twentieth harvest down there. Can you believe it? Um, the sad news is it's going to be a, a slightly lighter harvest than usual because we've got very badly um, frosted down there for the first time ever. Um, we're just not used to that um, in as because we're almost we're about um, 15 kilometers from the from the Mediterranean Sea. So, you know, very much it is we're close to the to the sea. We're just not used to those sort of temperatures. It does get cold in the winter, but um, usually as soon as the vines come out of dormancy, you, you, you it is very rare to ever have um, have frosts. But I digress. We, we um, so we have uh, 40 hectares of vines down there or 120 acres. Um, and we have 14 different grape varieties in the vineyard. So we, we are all about diversity down there. We've got six, uh, six whites and eight reds in the vineyard. Um, and I suppose uh, Sauvignon Blanc isn't necessarily an obvious grape to be growing in the warm, dry climate in the south of France. Um, however, uh, it's all about how you farm it and how you and when you pick it um, to really try and nurture those those aromatics and the really uh, vibrant varietal flavors. Now, um, pop your nose in in, um, in that Sauvignon Blanc right now. You're getting lots of of, of vibrant um, floral, but also gooseberry notes and um, and, and yeah, almost nettles. nettle yeah on on the nose there. Um, so this, I mean, it's 2020 harvest. This is from last year. Um, it is. Uh, 
I mean, it's designed to be, um, it's designed to have really good fresh acidity and be a very sort of zingy, fresh style. Um, and for those who, who know and love Sauvignon Blanc from, from New Zealand, ultimately with us, it's all about, it's all about when you pick it. So we pick at different stages. We pick some very early to make sure we get really good crisp acidity. And then we pick at slightly later stages when, when the grapes have picked up a little bit more sugar so that we get the real balance of that freshness, but also a little bit of mouthfeel so that it's not too sharp uh, and, uh, and, and um, you know, uh, yeah, not too sharp at the end of at the end of the palette. You just need a little bit more depth to it. So, um, twenty twenty was it was quite a hot. It was a warm growing season last year, um, but uh, we were picking this in probably the second week of of August. So um, early doors. Um, but if you leave it just even a week too late in the longer dock, the the high temperatures will mean that it'll go. It'll blow off a lot of that fruit, and you won't just you won't get that freshness to it. So um, anyway, I mean, yeah, we talked about how well it would go with with uh, with seafood. I mean, um, in the uh, in the Mediterranean, there in the Atang of the of the Languedoc, um, there, there's a lot of, of oysters, um, which you have to you know pick and choose your time to eat them. But over the winter and spring months, um, they're wonderful. So um, so we would say that, you know that's a perfect match for our Sauvignon Blanc. There, there's a rule about when you what months you eat oysters, something with not an R. Is it that's an R? That's it. It the has month. to have an R in it. The, the it month have have months have to have an, yeah, an R yeah. in it. Yeah. But the amount of people, um, Ray, you probably remember, remember this from the days of Vinny Sud and Montpellier. So it's the big uh, wine conference. And, you know, all the punters are coming from different parts of Europe. Um, and of course, the first thing they want to do is when they get off the plane is go and have a plate of um, oysters and, you know, a local white. And usually it's the next day, only half of the delegation shows up, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's just like, let me guess. Or, or they'll come to the tasting and then all of a sudden someone's like, oh, excuse me, I'll be back shortly. Yeah. So, um, you know, unfortunately, you get this so often that, that it actually puts you off eating eating the oysters, particularly if you don't know where they come from. I'd so. still actually say that Scottish and Irish oysters are probably cold water oysters yeah, cold that water. I would prefer. I'd yeah. take any day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And muscles too. Yeah. So the only yeah. other thing I'd say on the Sauvignons, for those on, on the line who, who who have bought our Sauvignon before, this is a bit of a plug for it. So the 2020, when it's gone, it's gone. Um, we uh, it, it's the, the frost has hit us very hard in France, and it, it was the earlier budding varieties that got hit hardest naturally. And um, our Sauvignon block, which we were looking at last week, is particularly hard hit. So if there's going to be a Sauvignon, a Simpson of Servi and Sauvignon Blanc 2021, it will be a small one. So you might want to stock your refrigerator with the 2020 because there won't be too much of a 21, mm. sadly. Mm. This is a really innocent question. I'm sick. I keep interrupting you, oh. Ray. I'm so sorry. This is a really innocent question. Is like if your grapes don't do what you expect them to do, is there anything else you can use them for? Well, firstly, you tell them off. <laughs> if they're not doing as they're supposed no. to, which doesn't normally work, but you try. Um, no, because no. because basically yeah. what happens, Antonia, is is what's happened is the but the early buds get burnt and then they never form um, the flowers and therefore they never form the structure of the grapes, so they don't produce anything at all. By the way, they continue to grow. If you walk through our vineyards last week, you go, you got frosted. I mean, it's beautiful. It's vibrant. There's all these green shoots, but the buds have been burnt, so there's no fruit. And actually, one of the the really frustrating things about being a, a farmer, particularly, but a, a grape farmer, is that because this crop, you know, or, or the vines will last 50, 60, 70 years, part of what we have to do is, is look after and shepherd the vine. And actually, it's not about this harvest. It's actually now protecting it for next year. And so the really sad thing is our inputs are, ident are identical. In fact, if in many respects, our inputs in terms of work, treatments, are even more to try and protect the vine in its stress state. Mm. So your costs are significant. And then you get to your harvest and you don't have one. Mm. And really what you're trying to do is fight to protect the new growth and the canes or the, the new growth that, that you will then tie down on the wire. Cause it's those canes that you tie down after the growing season that will form your buds for next year. So you're really making long-term decisions um, and, you know, as I said, it's really less about the 2021 now and more about the 2022, sadly. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, it, 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 this is, I think, the partnership between Naked Wines and National Trust of Scotland is about artisan and conservation. 
and the, the, you, you guys are are artists and there you are and that's what i personally i see wine as an art and a science art and a science but just you know how you style it i mean basically as you were talking earlier about the sparkling wine um, the autolysis, the, that bready character. And so that's up to you to decide how long do you leave it in bottle to create that flavor. Mm -hmm. I, I, I might be overly passionate about these things, but I do see it as an art. But then equally, we see it in, in already in um, the Georgian house, which we'll, we'll go back and, and take a look into that again. But you, you see the, the artistry in, in the, um, the cutlery, the, the, the setting, the crockery, but then the, the conservation, which you what you guys are doing is you know sustaining a vineyard which basically requires about 20 years 30 years and then it's really giving its best thing but it's also conservation of the ecosystem as you said Ruth mm -hmm. you've got six reds eight whites all the way around and uh, you know for, you've got plenty of varieties there and with the National Trust for Scotland they have the nature reserves and it's it's basically everything what you've been hit with this time guys and dare I say it as I think you already accept it will happen or it may happen again but we're facing a turning point whether you believe it or not who are our, our valued viewers but you know there is a turning point in our climate and what that does and how we have to adapt and basically what we can conserve and um, so that we can move on and move on centuries and we, we, we've just been discussing a family of 200 years ago and and now we have and we will expect to be discussed and remember when they did all those zoom calls for that year uh mm -hmm. 200 years time and you know zoom will be a thing of the past but um so i think that's that sort of highlights where the beauty of our trusts on this island specifically in in scotland crosses over with the artistry of wine you know and and mm -hmm. the as, as you told us earlier antonia about you know the, the the trade and the culture and what what came in and what went out and so on mm -hmm. so but I think also, you know, it's interesting because we, we're in a situation now, aren't we, with the environment where we've realised we've got to a point where <clears throat> we're demanding things that um, perhaps we shouldn't be demanding. So back in the Georgian period, you had to wait another year if your coffee ran out because the coffee wasn't coming over every single day to your, your grocery mm -hmm. store. Very the good. same with the wine. So the wine would come into the port and it would be, be decanted um, and then you'd have to wait another year for the next load to come through. So, you know, they were they were they were globalizing. So they were at a period. It's almost like they were at the other end of the spectrum to where we are now. They were globalizing, experienced that expansion of trade but they were also still patient. But now, 200 years later, we're impatient. We're like, mm. where are my tomatoes from Portugal? And where's my wine, you know? And, and I think that we need, I mean, I'm speaking personally, but I, I do think stepping back and saying, you know, we have become impatient individuals and maybe learning from the past a little bit and seeing how you go with the season and you go, you know, with, with the crop that you've got and, and you're patient. Yes, it, it's, it's very, very well summarized. And I think it does require that it has its economic implications on, in the case of Charles and Ruth and this frost. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah. it's a good point. Sorry, yeah. Ruth. Yeah. No, but all I was going to say, I mean, ultimately, we live by that cycle, you know, on an annual basis, because in both of our properties, you know, we only make wine from our own grapes. We do, we can't buy, you know, as a proprietor of Coltons in France, we, we're not allowed to mm. buy in from anywhere else. So ultimately, and, and for us, it is all about that provenance story as well. It's all about mm. um, the fact that we're controlling everything from the grapes to the glass, um, as we do here in England as well. So, um, so you are about, you know, ultimately, that, that agricultural cycle is is still really, you know, the cycle of our, you know, our whole activity mm -hmm. every year. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was quite interesting, the, um, the towns that seem to be the most, uh, the strongest wine importers in, in the kind of end of the 18th century or in the 18th century in general. Well, quick freeze. Um, where Bordeaux, as we mentioned, so I don't know if that means anything to you. It means very little to me as far as the kind of scope of where the wines are coming from and what that means that people were receiving. Antonia, you, you know, what kind of wines they were actually consuming. Can you just repeat? I think well, from Sorry. my side, maybe it was just my side, uh, but you, Sorry, did I go out? Yeah. yeah so no, it's okay. The, the, so the towns, the towns, the towns were Bordeaux, Rochelle, Rouen, and Dieppe. 
So I'm just curious as to what that means for what kind of wines Edinburgh was receiving at the time. Yeah, they're, they're all um, yeah they're all Atlantic, aren't they? They're so, all Atlantic yeah. and up to the up to the sort of north uh, northwest, yeah. aren't they? So it's probably all proximal, I guess, and and being trading routes, um, ease of ease of transportation, I should think. Mm. Yeah, and they may have been carted to, from wherever they were in France, mm -hmm. and then trade like they'd meet midway in the country, Limoges. Oh yeah. I just what I mean is um, what flavors are they getting? So from those particular regions, what kind of wines are they consuming? Oh, well, well, not, sorry, go ahead, Ray. Well, it's, uh, simply what I would say. So they they, they they would be tasting wines from Bordeaux, La Rochelle, your sort of Bordeaux as well. And as you go north, you're in Loire, and you might have if they were if they were interested in why you have the Sauvignon Blanc or you'd have Cabernet Franc or something. And so that's what they'd be getting from that immediate, I think is what you're saying, Charles, immediate to the coast. But mm. what you might imagine, and I have no clue what I'm talking about here, is where you might have from the eastern side of France, mm -hmm. um, where they came to a focal point in the center of France, they brought their wines there, it was traded, and it was then further transported on. But I guess, actually, this would bring us seamlessly to the next <laughs> slide, where we, we will get a, a greater view of um, if, if I may take this, so let me go again and share. This is very kind. What slide are you giving me this time? Um, let's have a look. Um, so uh, can you see that clearly? Let me just make that a full screen like that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Antonio, yeah. thank you for sharing these images with us. No, so that's this is okay. So, I mean, I, we've talked about a little bit of this before, really, but it's just sort of, you know, saying again that these different wines being served with with each course now whiskey was obviously distilled all over Scotland but wine was all imported and rum as well was imported um and the interesting thing about Leith which is the port in Edinburgh that used to be its own independent city Edinburgh was its own um borough and city in its own right and Leith was outside of that um they had a uh um a big glass factory I can't remember, Ruth, if you were talking about this before, um, but by 1770, this enormous glass factory was down by the port, was producing one million bottles per week, wow. per week to accommodate the growing demand for wine in, in the city and in Scotland in general, and for whiskey as well. They bottled whiskey as well. Um, and they then exported it across the British Empire. So it didn't just all say in Scotland. But when the barrels of wine and spirits arrived at Leith, they were swiftly decanted into bottles from the factory that literally sat beside the port. Um, and so that just gives you a sense of how immense <laughs> the production was. And you, if you were a butler um, and you were buying your wine, you would go up to a grocery or a grocer's in Edinburgh. And those are the people who sold it. Um, you know, the, by 1800s, um, people were selling wine across the city or across in different high streets or different streets, rather. But before that, it had been the, the top end of the high street. So if anybody's been to Edinburgh, the Royal Mile stretches from the Holyrood Palace at the bottom to the castle at the top. And the top half near the castle, they were the ones that were only allowed to sell foreign goods. So you'd only find spices and silks and um expensive wines up at the top end of the high street everything else um that was domestic um was sold further down mm. so that was that had changed by 1800 though there were more shops um in different streets than in the new town um so we've kind of talked about the wines and the different wines coming in and i, I kind of i'm glad you brought this slide up because i wanted to just talk about the butler he was quite crucial at this particular townhouse so a bigger house like maybe the one that you would see um, uh, in an estate or something like that would have had live-in servants and would have had up to, I don't know, 50 odd servants, uh, many of whom would live in. But at the Lamont's home in Edinburgh in 1800, there were only seven of a day um, in and pretty much none of them, except for the butler, lived in the house. Occasionally a maid might sleep upstairs in the attic um, if they had a, a party or something. Um, so what the butler would do is he would go and bring servants in. He would go and find servants for the night. So if we were there for dinner, there would be servants that would have served somebody else's house the night before. They pretty much all lived in the old town. Servants were really expensive. 
comparatively now, they would have been expected to be paid £10 a year, which was a pricey compared to what they were paid before. But there were cotton mills and coal mines and various other places across Scotland paying a lot more. So they had to um, up their wages and a lot of the servants came from the Highlands. So they came down um, to work and they would walk down to the Georgian house to serve us for our dinner. So if you were um, at dinner, um, pretty much the only person you would see would be the butler. Everybody else was behind the scenes, the kind of under um, um, below below stairs sort of idea. Now the butler was really important because he had the keys to the um, the wine cellar that you saw there and the wine cellars were so you can see the bins sorry I'm flicking backwards and forwards the bins were often made like this they were brick um, to keep the, the wine relatively cool uh, each bin had a different label as we'd seen before so you could see what was what they were all in these bottles um, and stacked and it was just the butler who had the key um, and so he was in charge of buying the wines, choosing the wines for the night, serving the wines. And in the Lamont house, he was also the valet. So he was the guy who got the got John Lamont ready, picked out his clothes and ironed his clothes, pressed his shirts. He was the one who was serving your wine at dinner. He was the one who polished the plate. He, he polished the furniture. So he had quite an immense um, range of duties and he got 20 pounds a year for all of his his skills, which I think is you know, kind of incredible. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so I just think in a way when you're there, you, um, you're, you're drinking your wine because you're a part of the kind of more wealthy middle class. So the Lamonts weren't aristocrats. They were wealthy, um, wealthy class. They were cheap. He was the chief of a clan, but he wasn't an aristocrat. Um, if you were a middling class, so if you were kind of one of us, somebody who had a profession or a skilled laborer, um, you would be um, in the ale houses drinking ale um, and possibly rum and whiskey. Um, and the poorer classes were were simply drinking watered down ale. Um, and they, they would go to taverns as well. But um, the taverns were really the kind of place where the middle classes went to talk politics. So taverns and coffee houses were the kind of the place you went, you went to drink coffee and drink ale and talk about the politics of the day. It's where lots of different classes met. And Edinburgh actually was one of the most unusual um, kind of centers in the 1600s where aristocrats and poorers lived cheek by jowl. They lived next to each other. Um, and so there was this kind of flow of discussion um, and trading, which was quite rare in other cities. Um, and was kind of the precursor to Scotland's enlightenment, which is kind of cool. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Jane. I'm going to go, I'm going to jump to to this slide which you shared, but th this is the the upstairs upstairs downstairs. Yes. So York. this is the kitchen at the Georgian House, which um, has some of the the plate in the background there, um, so you can see the fake chickens that are on the rotisserie um, by the fire. Um, the range, um, a house like this would have had a range um, such as this, although this is not original to the house. Talking about conservation, um, Georgian House was conserved by the trust um, and everything in the Georgian House, all the objects are not original to the house. The thing that is original is all of the interiors. So we can have a bit of fun at the Georgian House, having people sit down and, um, you know, and do some events and that kind of thing. Um, but we give a try to give a sense of what it was like living there at the time. So the range was only for very wealthy people. And prior to this, so um, a century before, they didn't exist. It was just an open fire. And in the in the very background, which is hard to see in this, but um, there's another black um, kind of metal iron instrument. That's a bake. That's a baking. Wow. Um, thing yes. for bread um, and the rotisserie which is the thing I mentioned that would have cooked the, the um, venison earlier that's where those really shiny looking chickens are, no. are on there um, so and then the bells were put in um, and could only be operated obviously from the room down so servants couldn't communicate up to the to the um, 
the family. The family could only communicate down. So when they were ready for the next course or ready for anything, if they needed more wine, the bells, the bells would ring. But the trick was that the butler had to be there before the bell rang, because if the bell rang, it meant they were getting impatient and, and that was not a good thing. So um, that, it was important to, to sort of know, know your job. There was also a servants hall down here, which is where the servants, so the servants often got paid in food and drink. And so they, they would get the leftovers from the meal. So they'd have a mixture of a bit of their pea soup and a mixture of a few, I'm sure there wouldn't have been any oysters left. Um, so they would get their leftovers plus bread and um, basics um, that would have been available, probably not huge amounts of meat because the meat was so expensive. Um, so that's downstairs in the Georgian house and the butler would have had a room down there right next to the wine cellar. Awesome. Just to keep an eye. Yeah, that's it. So we, can go. Uh, well, we might do we have one more slide on that way. Oh yeah, the glass will we must must oh display. yeah, the glasses. Or, so we've got quite a selection or collection, I should say, of glasses across the trust in all the different um properties. Uh and these ones are actually from a collection at a house called Hill of Tarvit, which is in Fife near St Andrews. Um and I bought these because they are um 18th century, um 1700s. But because I don't know if anybody knows about the Jacobite Rose, and I think it's kind of interesting. So back when um, James II, James VII was ousted and thrown out of the country for um, William and Mary came in um, in the 1680s, um, the Jacobites rose to try and get back onto the throne. And there were signs and symbols that you had to really subtly kind of communicate whether you were a supporter or not. And you couldn't come out and say you're a supporter because you could get your head chopped off or hung, drawn and quartered. So the rose was one of those symbols. And you see a lot of glassware. The white rose stands for the Duke of York. And that was James VII was Duke of York. And if you were handed a glass by the butler in a house, so if we were kind of in the earlier part of the 18th century and it had a rose on it, that was a communication that you're with Jacobite friends. Now, if you weren't a Jacobite and you challenged it, they would just say, it's just a decoration. It's just a, it's just a lovely flower. What are you talking about? But the wonderful thing about the wine glass is that obviously when the liquid fills up, especially the red, you've got that blood, you've got that anger, you've got that fight, you've got that spirit. Um, by the time we're in the Georgian house in 1800, those, these are sort of romantic, um, romantic gestures so if we are in 1800 walter scott the famous scottish writer is already thinking about what he's going to do to spin the story of the 45 when they rose at Culloden and, and and lost at Culloden in 46 and it's already being stun, spun into a story called waverley which he published in 1814 and just romanticized the whole Jacobite Highland affair. So they became more sort of heroes of the Highlands and all of the sort of nuances and the intricacies of people's reasons for supporting James VII were just sort of weren't, weren't talked about. It was all, so when you're drinking for one of these glasses at the Georgian house in 1800, you're probably telling some spin story about how your ancestor fought in the highlands you know in the dead of night in the cold of winter and all that sort of stuff not talking about your political allegiance my gosh that's fantastic what i, I think i didn't know i needed that in my life for past beautifully explained as well i'm sorry i have to say it's lovely yeah, you speak so was, well and passionately about it um i guess, it was bonnie prince charlie wasn't it that yes was, that was who they used to toast wasn't it bonnie prince charlie there you go yeah that's right because he was the steward he was the son and <clears throat> yeah he was the one they were trying to get back on the throne mm. they just couldn't do it yeah. yeah and that's you know i think outlander does that outlander goes back and goes through all of that i think mm. i haven't watched it but i think that's what they do yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean for 20 quid i need a butler i mean with doing yes what, i mean <laughs> who doesn't need a butler it's pretty right? pretty year brilliant eh? Like a serious multitasker yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i've got my husband but i haven't quite trained him to um <laughs> press all my shirts in the morning and all that sort of stuff <laughs> well while whilst we take a moment there charles and ruth can we have a, uh, an introduction to your 
third and final wine of this evening, but there, there are more wines in the case that people oh, have. Yeah, I'm gonna take this is the um, Simpsons of Serbian as the Cuvée Special Syrah. So Syrah like Shiraz and it's from the, the south of France. So please tell us about this. And then following that, I'm going to take some of the questions from uh, that have been submitted already into the Q&A. So, oh yeah, and my last slide is a little bit of a kind of, um, Antique Roadshow Guessathon, so we can do that as well, if you like, if we've got time. Okay. So, Ray, the special Cuvée 2019. <coughs> um, firstly, can I just say, and, and I'm not tooting our own horn, but I've not tasted this wine Delicious. for probably a month or so, because it was relatively recently bottled. It was yeah. January or February. Right. And I am mesmerized by it, and, and dare I say it myself, it's showing so well. Maybe it's these incredible Zolto big bulbous glasses that we have it, have it in, but the wine is so expressive and it just totally jumps out of the, the glass. So um, Ray, you know, at Santros, we've got three different blocks of syrup of relative ages. And this top cuvee, this top special syrup that we do for you guys, comes from the lowest yielding. So the, the, the least amount of fruit the vine produces, the more concentrated it is. If you think about it, it's like a human being, you only have so much energy. And if you're, if you're producing 15 uh, uh, bunches, then the energy has to go into 15 uh, bunches. So if, you, if you're only producing two or three, that energy goes into two or three and you get sugar and ripeness and concentration. So um, all of the this wine comes from, of all things, it's what we call grafted syrup. So once upon a time, it started life as a variety called Sanso. Uh, and vines are amazing things. So the root stock is nearly 60 years old. So the actual, the, 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 the roots in the ground are Sanso and they're about 60 years old. And about two, it was 2000, wasn't it? Mm. Um, the, the previous owner before us um, basically uh, cut, cut the, the root uh, down to about maybe a foot off the ground. And you took clippings from other part of the vineyard, it was Syrah, and you graft on, you literally shave back the bark, mm -hmm. put on the clipping, wrap it up with a bit of tape and guess what the year after you have that new clone or that new variety so even though it is only 20 years old in terms of the, the when the grafting was done the root stock you know is, is 60 years old and so you get this natural uh, concentration so it's the best syrup block uh, that we have and it's just so um, concentrated I mean it's got you know a lot of you know um, black fruits has got a lot of damson, but what really is overpowering for me is like the 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 white pepper and the tobacco. You know, it's um it's like opening a humidor in a in a cigar shop, and that comes from also the the, the wine spent ten months in oak barrels, so yeah. it sort of picks up a tobacco-y mocha um, type type characters. So we only buy uh, French oak um, for these barrels. Um, the, the the best money can buy they're a, a, a cooperage called Taranso. Um, and boy, it's just, it's got this lovely deep flavor that um, just lingers and lingers. So minimally filtered. So it, it may over the years pop a sediment, but that's, that's fine. And the whole idea is with minimal filtration is not to strip the wine of, of color, aromatics and, and flavor. Um, and, you know, in terms of food pairing, this would go wonderfully well with lamb and Tonya, um, mm. but also, you know, barbecue, um, you know, meat, slow roasted rib of beef, um, you know, something that's, you know, you know, big and bold mm. to go with, with, with the wine. So, or, yeah. Or you could even go daring and go with, a, with a, a, like a dark chocolate dessert. So actually that intensity mm. you can pair with like, with really bit dark bits of dark, chocolate. Yeah. chocolate as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. I, what I picked up on, and I do, I do also think it is the best vintage I've tasted of it. But is the texture, the mouthfeel? It's far more glossy, textural, and silky. It's, I mean, it's really, yeah. It, it, it previously it was sort of finding its way and its interaction with the oak, and it was positively angular, and now it's just easily voluptuous and silky it's mm. beautiful wine it's going down a little too easy which unfortunately <laughs> yes. we're out of time so good night everybody <laughs> no, no, we, we still have time we, we we would we should jump in and i'd love to take some of these questions from and thank you very much everyone for partaking joining in the chat and, and especially here for those who've contributed questions to the q a so steven allenson thank you were dessert wines popular in Georgian times or not? And this, I'm going to put the question to Antonia. So you had slightly touched on it before with some of the things we talked about, but 
dessert wine. So we saw so turn there. That's a dessert wine. Antonia, yeah. what would you say? Um, I have to profess my innocence on this. I would say yes, absolutely, because um, the the theory was that you had lots of um, courses, and then with every every course there was a wine. So I imagine that there were, and so turn is is there as a um, an actual kind of bin in the cellar. Um, I I would actually defer to Charles and Ruth here. Do you know? Um, do you know if there were any wines being imported early on that were particularly? Well, it would be that Sauterne, which, which mm -hmm. comes from around the Bordeaux area. So, um, mm -hmm. so absolutely, that would they would have been bringing. And Madeira, and this Madeira is a sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more of a fortified, but it's um, but yeah, um, it comes with some sort of sugar angle to it. I think, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah different levels. So. And we would say yes, indeed. We would say yes. I'm afraid I don't know which. No, that, that's no. So Sauterne, I think, is. I mean, it, was, it, it is one of the most famous sweet wines in the world. Yeah. Well, and, and you must you'll remember Ray that one of Napoleon's favorite drinks when he was imprisoned in South Africa was Klein de Constance. So you know, and that was what I guess 18th um, century. And so obviously, you know, definitely there was a lot of sweet round wine around the time. Uh, yes. So I mean, that time. It was actually, I mean, maybe it was maybe it was early 1900s, but certainly, yeah, mid 1800s. It, it was it was Hock was the most expensive wine on a list. So German sweet wines were more expensive than Chateau Lafitte. Which My goodness! Now wow. today, the tables expensive. turn. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, that, those were the sought after wines were sweet wines. So certainly, sweet wines were de rigueur at the time, Stephen. Uh, we, we'll go to the next question from Steve F. Charles and Ruth, lots of English whites about, but what are the main barriers to producing quality English reds in volume? Can you produce a Pinot Noir? By the way, I loved the Languedoc when spending a couple of weeks there some years ago. So where is England on reds? Oh, um, let's, yeah. Yeah, so, so answering uh, the first question, uh, the, the last question first, so, so do we make Pinot Noir? Yes, we do. Um, slowly but surely, the longer that we've been making wine in Kent, the more confidence we have to push the limits. We are understanding the climate, we're understanding the terroir. But more importantly, what we've also discovered is the right combination of clones and rootstock. So a lot of the English um, producers as you know, everyone accepts English sparkling wine. Um, and so, so but, but within, for example, the variety that is Chardonnay or Pinot Noir, there are sparkling clones and there are still wine clones. They're, they're all Chardonnay and they're all Pinot Noir, but they have different characters that slightly different modifications of that particular variety. And what we've done at Simpsons Wine Estate is we've not only planted the Champagne clones to make the sparkling wines, but we've also planted the Burgundian still wine clones that are designed to be um, to produce um, still wines. And every year that goes past, we get more and more confidence. What we've realized is you have to de-stem because oftentimes you can produce red wines with whole bunches. But what you discover is that the berries uh, become ripe, phenolically ripe, but that the stems and the pips are actually underripe and green. So what we've discovered, the first thing you have to do is de-stem. And you wouldn't necessarily normally do that. You wouldn't always do that in southern France, but that's because anatomically everything's ripe. So you've got to try and separate the on underripe components of the bunch uh, from the riper components. And if you do that um, and, and, and the growing conditions are right, this year is a bit more challenging because May has been awful. Um, but last year we were able to produce, hold the phone, 13.5% uh, uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, and we're making tiny amounts of it. And we hope it will be the first English wine to sell over a hundred pounds a bottle. Yeah, so, that'd be um, so yes, we think we can, we think we can challenge some of the best that Burgundy uh, uh, can make. Um, and if you don't believe me, um, come on down and see us because we're producing a wine called the Rabbit Hole. Um, and it is extraordinary, particularly from 2020. And we've got Rabbit Hole Plus coming. So, yeah. Wow. All coming out tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Press releases here. So, fantastic. Well, thanks for, for that question, Steve, because I, I didn't know any of that. And it's very exciting. Great stuff, guys. Uh, Tina Barker, our own Tina, I guess, our Archangel. A question for Antonia and Charles and Ruth. Would the wealthy guests be drinking champagne or was there another sparkling wine at the time? And I'm going to, I, I'll give this one to you, Ruth. You were, you were talking about Mr. Merritt earlier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, ultimately champagne, um, 
the the history of sparkling wine um, and the reason why I suppose uh, England has a bit of heritage as far as sparkling wine is concerned is that um, in the actually in the 16th century um, the UK that had developed um, charcoal fired, fired furnaces which meant that they could make stronger glass than they could on the continent and um, and actually the wines that were being brought over to Scotland, England, to 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 all to the British Isles at that stage, because they were being uh, transported, um, they didn't have the refrigerated lorries or, or refrigerated tankers at the time. Um, a lot of those wines were were being transported, and they were quite unstable. And actually, um, they were naturally fermenting, doing um, undergoing a secondary fermentation during that transport process, which gave them a little bit of a sparkle. Obviously, that um, the CO um, two uh, manifesting in the wine, and people actually found that they preferred it. And um, and so actually, this was uh, this was documented by a guy called uh, Christopher Merritt in sixteen sixty. To, he presented a paper to the Royal Society in London um, about the, the deliberate addition of sugar or molasses to wine to make them taste uh, brisk and sparkling, I think his words were. But, but that, 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 all of that uh, actually happened in the UK about 35 years before Don Perignon saw, saw the stars in his glass and, 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 and uh, as history says, invented champagne. So, so all of that happened, I suppose, 16th Thursday. You know, late 16th century. So I'm sure they probably were drinking champagne at that stage. I think it was even then it was becoming quite uh, very popular and probably quite expensive. So I'd say only the very upper classes were were uh, would be would have been able to um, to have afforded it at that stage. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but they would have been bringing that over from from France um, at that stage. Certainly, I don't think they were making any in the UK. But uh, but uh, they were reliant on bringing wine over from France, and then perhaps they were adding sugar and molasses when they were bottling them in in Leith, as you were talked about earlier, Antonia. Well, that's so interesting. I and and I couldn't add anything to that at all. <laughs> that's really really yeah. fantastic. Thank you, Tina. It's a good question. But I mean, that's it's an incredible insight into basically where England or the UK was in in the origin of sparkling wine. Um, mm. We are over time, but I think if people want to hang around, I will go through this Q&A because I think it's just fascinating. Any, anytime anyone asks a question, these responses are incredible, very informative. So uh, anonymous attendee, Light Harvest, Ray, what impact will this have on future prices? Mm. I think <laughs> this, this question is, because we, we are having this discussion with all of our French and Italian or those who most of the European winemakers who, who were hit by that frost in April. And if you don't have the wine, you can't sell it. And if you don't have something to sell, you can't put a price on it. So it's more about shortage of supply. And from our side, it's more about <clears throat> commitment and what we can do to, to ensure, let's say, the sustainability, the, you know, where that wine will be next year. And uh, Charles and Ruth shared with us their scenario this week, and um, I'm catching up with my, my fellow mate, Matt, and we're going to look at what we can do. So in terms of what it'll do for prices, it's a good, it's a fair question to look at it this, that way. I think if we look at the three wines we're drinking tonight, let's just take the Sauvignon Blanc, which is right here. This is an excellent quality Sauvignon Blanc. It's, and it should always be Charles Root might not agree, but I think it should always reflect its quality. The price should always reflect its quality. What goes on behind the scenes is up to Charles and Ruth and Nake to sort out. Okay, but when the customer gets it, you know, you have your own problems day to day. And when you get home Tuesday evening, 7 p.m., you want to open a glass of wine that you paid X amount for and drink it. So it will affect the economics, but it won't affect the price if that's a. Uh, Fair enough answer. Yeah. And that, that's a really, really good, um, really good answer, Ray. And actually, I was the anonymous person. I put that because I was just about to tell you is that we were raising our prices threefold. And I thought it was easier to do it, you know, through the back door than tell you. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. The only thing I'd, the thing I'd add to that, by the way, and, and those were all really well made points. You know, there's a there's a naked answer to that question, which Ray gave, and he's sincere, and it's absolutely true, which is why we love these guys so much and have worked with them for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rest of the world. You do not have um, incredible clients like Naked who make the sort of commitments at Vintage and, and, and are doing long-term planning three, four years out in terms of volume commitment. So we are very fortunate that we are um, have Naked as, as a partner. The other thing that 
you know, uh, warts and all. Um, the wine industry is dreadfully unfair, right? And um, like life. And, you know, there are appellations that enjoy incredible high price points, whether they be Champagne, Bordeaux and Burgundy. And then you have poorer areas like the Languedoc. And the reality is that the market won't accept price increases from the Languedoc. The reality is when you hear about frosting and Burgundy and Champagne and Bordeaux, please feel sorry for them, but not to the same extent that you should do for the, a Languedoc producer. Um, because in, in, in Burgundy and Bordeaux, the wines are so coveted and they can sell those wines three, four times over. All they do or can do is just increase prices. Uh, the problem with the Languedoc is I couldn't, um, to most of our uh, uh, um, buyers around the world, it, it give them price increases because at the front end of wine, unfortunately, there's a commodity dimension to it. And so if someone, if a supermarket wants an eight ninety nine dollars Sauvignon Blanc, they don't care if it comes from the Languedoc or Chile. And that's just the, the sad reality. So um, it's through partnerships with people like Naked that, that make um, small, authentic um, properties like ours being able to survive because they'll have a proper adult um, conversation with us about how we make it through. Because I'm sure, you know, that you know, Ray's point is that we may have to take a year out from a couple of these wines, but we'll be back again in 2020. And that, you know, makes the story that much more authentic, right? You know, you, you, Mother Nature is on forgiving and you, you take the randomness of it. Yeah, it's farming. And it's farming. That's right. Yeah. And we, that's it. Take care of our planet, folks, everyone. Okay, we will, we will go now to sort of, um, let's say, 10 second snappy responses to the following i'm going to say five or six <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm loving it i'm loving it and if people you know it's not that we're in a rush because i don't think anyone's going anywhere but let's just do, in case for those who want to watch back and keep it it's succinct so uh gregor how was the last cold snap affected how has the last cold snap affected your vines i think we may have been covering it but Ruth, if you just want to sort of summarize it in 10 yeah. seconds or less um, in 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 kent <laughs> In Kent, it's meant that um, actually the vines have uh, come out of dormancy slower this year because it's been a co cooler spring, which has meant that when there has been frost, we haven't suffered from any damage in the UK uh, yet. And I think we're out of the uh, danger zone. So, oh, yeah, good. We're out so of fine. time is what we are. Fine. <laughs> fine. Fine. <laughs> good. Uh, and Alexander, thank you. It, if a vine is frosted one year, is the following year better as the vine has had a summer of growth? without feeding the fruit. Uh, yeah, so it does, it, Charles, yeah. It, yeah, so it does, stir, it does store energy. Uh, as you, I might have alluded to earlier, the problem is you need to protect the canes in the frosted year to make sure that they are healthy enough to tie down in the following year. So in terms of the- I'm so the sorry, sorry you're out of time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you, move on. you were aware of it and you, you directed it. It was a disappointment. Yeah, it was just that extra point. Yeah. <laughs> we spent more time talking about how you failed it than you did talk. So Jane, um, does the severe weather affect your vines or are they climate hardy? Um, again, we've possibly covered this in a number of senses as, as the conversation has continued. And it is just, I think what you mentioned, Ruth, was that the, uh, your proximity to the Mediterranean, where you do get that moderation of climate, it's unusual to get it. So even though you have these old vines, sturdy they get knocked out it was an, anom an anomaly of a vintage is that right that's right that's right um and and i think the key is also the growing period and back to climate change if you have a very very warm early spring like we did uh in 2017 here in the uk march was very warm the, the vines came out of dormancy much earlier uh, and then when the frost hit in april they were far more advanced there was more damage done gotcha. mm. I, th I think i think i was over 10 seconds there to be honest Audrey, um, how old are your vines and does the frost damage worsen the older the vine is? So just, yeah, two, two quick points there. Um, so yes, so they run the gamut. We've got vines that we planted two years ago, so they'll be two years older than not even cropping. Um, and then down in France, we've got 65 year old vines. And actually I would say that the, the older the vine, the more reserves it has, the hardier it is. Um, teenage and middle-aged is fine. It's the younger vines also take the hit. Great, thank you. Karen, from Karen, would some of the Roussillon Languedoc wines have been exported from Spain as back then they were part of the Occitan? Sherry must have been exported from Spain. Really? Mm. <laughs> um, 
I'm sure they, they could well have been um, exported actually. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I'm trying to remember when the canal, the other thing, the other route they could have taken is the Canal du Midi, because that link, linked up, was that, or was that Napoleon who built that? Because that linked up to the um, so between Chiron and, yeah, and would have gone out at, uh, would have gone out at Bordeaux. So you have to go around the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah. so the, actually the Mediterranean and Bordeaux were linked by the Canal du Midi and then the River Chiron, yeah. So that, we, we, I think we have, we're, we're confident in the geography or the, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the layout. We're unsure about the exact timing of it, whether that was relative to the yeah. there. Very good. Just in case this has been, well, it is being recorded and we might get sort of pulled up. Fact checkers. Exactly. Yeah. Anonymous Tendi, FB question. Uh, question from Facebook. I love Rosé, Charles and Ruth. Why is there a stigma to drinking it for some people? Me, I have a stigma against it. It's too sweet for me. But oh, maybe it's not. Oh, yeah, you're them, drinking the wrong, wrong rosé. <laughs> yeah, you need to start drinking our rosé. It's bone dry. Okay. All right, tell me about your rosé, and I will drink your rosé. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I don't understand that stigma either, and I think it is. I think that stigma is ch changing. Changed, Certainly changed. around here in this part of Kent, I went to uh, the Picket Bridge place the other day, and there were six blokes, and they had a bottle of rosé each. I mean, honestly, they all they needed was straws. So, you know, I've seen grown men, grown men having one or two bottles each. So, so I think it's coming. Uh, we love rosé, and I think it's you know, there's times for white, there's times for red. But you know, if you're just in a happy place on a summer day, there's nothing like a decent rosé. But a dry rosé, a dry rosé, rose, no would be, wouldn't be all over any sweet rosés. Yeah. And from my position, with like I, I am fortunate to taste quite a lot of wine and lots of rosé, and it is a very long time since I've tasted a sweet rosé. Um, it's, right. it's pretty it's predominantly dry and i so i think an indicator on rosé is the color but that mm -hmm. was an indicator in the past so you had uh, gallo doing um white zinfandel and that mm -hmm. was sweet basically and i don't even know if it exists anymore but particularly so now a lot of producers have gone to a sort of a paler pink so rosé i would say is majorly uh is that the right word uh dry okay moving on Oops. thanks for that question uh, Jay Coombs, question for Ruth and Charles. To what extent, and 10 seconds, to what extent are they feeling the impact of climate change and how is the industry responding collectively? Um, well, uh, yeah, I think mentioned before, it's, it's all about making sure the vines don't come out of dormancy uh, too soon. Um, but then, there, I mean, there, there is freak weather conditions as well. I mean, the longer dog regularly get, actually gets hit by hail later in the season, usually sort of May time, or uh, well, actually May June time. Um, happily, Touchwood, we haven't um, we haven't suffered from that before, but it can be very localized and, and slightly freak. Um, and you know, just a couple of years ago, I think Provence got hit very badly, literally, and it, it literally can shred a vineyard. You know, a little literally will strip it, will strip vines. So, um, and then obviously, you know, the climate change in California. Has you know, there's obviously been the, the, the devastating fires, um, same thing in Australia and flooding as well. So, I think you know, regard globally, it is being impacted, no doubt, with with uh, with freak weather conditions. Can I answer the second question? What, what is the industry doing collectively to fight climate change? Because I think it's a really relevant question. Mm -hmm. So, firstly, um, grape growing is actually relatively carbon neutral because guess what? You know, on our estates, we've got 120,000 little vines soaking up CO2. So taking out uh, CO2 and producing oxygen for you all to breathe. So the key is in terms of being a proper carbon neutral winery is what you do to capture your CO2 in the winery. And there's a lot of technology now about CO2 capture because it's, it's actually the fermentation process that actually makes um, businesses on uh, um, carbon friendly. So there's a lot of technology um, now being looked at in terms of capturing that CO2 in, in wine production. And then we're actually incredibly green. Mm. And lightweight, lighter weight glass is mm -hmm. an important point as well. So it's a con to keep in mind. And so Gregor, again, hello again, uh, are any of these wines of particularly high proof? So being, I think, what is the ABV, the alcohol? That's what 14. 14, 14. Yeah. So 14 percent on this one. And it's 12. SB is 12, yeah. and Bior is 14. <laughs> 15 and a half, no, 12. Biora. Biora, Biora, Biora. Yeah. 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 So I, I, your definition, I mean, th th those are the, the, the alcohol ranges on it, and uh, it's your definition of high, 14%. That's my comfortable number. 15% mm. 
I just don't get along with it. It's not in any yeah. sort of ethical piece. It's just like I taste it and then I can taste it and I go, I'm drinking yeah. alcohol. I don't really want to drink alcohol. I want to drink wine. So yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to the pub anymore. Yeah. But the, but the 14 would, would reflect just that, that concentration. It's a heavier style and therefore, you know, it, it needs a little bit of weight behind it um, just because of the style of wine it is and where it comes from. Southern France. Uh, Ian, I think this is Ian Ar Archangel, Ian Held. Uh, was the choice of wine the sole decision of the butler? Or would the house owner also decide? Did the butlers, did the butlers ever get sucked for poor decision on wine? Sacked, I imagine. I, I, don't, I don't know of a particular case where a butler got sacked, but I imagine so. If, if the guests were unhappy, then yes, the servants would go. Um, the butler was the one who um, chose the wine uh, and he would have been informed that the wine wasn't, didn't taste right or go find something else. So he would have been the one who would have talked to the grocer, the grocer would have been the one to talk to the dealer, the trader, and that would be the way. Had, there's no way that a, a wealthy merchant would have gone into a grocery shop and um, traded okay. like that. That's great, Antonia. That shows the sort of, well, the supply chain, as we yeah. call it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, uh, Vince, and we have, oh, we're going on too far now, folks. We have we have to shut this place down. That we're going to, the internet goes off in my place. The generator runs out. <laughs> if, I, if I find a few more 10 Ps, I'll stick them in, but that's, I'm going to take three more. So, Andy, do the quiz. Fair enough, Andy. Let's do the quiz. Antonia, can we do the quiz? This oh, is the yeah. I mean, it's right. not difficult, to be fair. Okay, it's the last It's the last one on the list. Okay. Um, so I want to know uh, which item here was made um, latest, which is the kind of the most recent item. So it's the next one after this, I think. Is it? Okay. Oh, here we That's go. That's it. Ooh. So which of those is the most recent object and and what is and what are those objects i mean i think charles and ruth you can imagine you know exactly what they are yes mm -hmm. so as you're guessing um they're called cellarettes um they're basically mini cellars mini wine cellars or um what became known as a wine cooler um different periods and so um i'm going to go through them the one in the middle um is the oldest it's the antique wine cooler which was known as became known as a cellaret that was originally made from a tub of stone marble metal or earthenware this one dates to the mid 1700s um as the consumption of wine increased the furniture increased um and some cellarets um were in pieces of furniture like this one on the left hand side well my left i don't know if it's your left um and this one would have held the bottles from Leith, which were longer bottles with longer um, stems that we have now, necks, not stems, that we have now. It can hold, hold 12 and it was often lined in order to keep them cool on casters so you could roll it towards the table. Um, up until late 1700s, the butler got your wine. He, he took your glass and got your wine for you. He gave you a glass. But by the time we're 1800, We've got wine bottles on the table. Um, we've got people serving themselves, except for women. Women weren't allowed to serve themselves, of course. Um, and so the cellaret down there, which movable under the table, dates to about the 1770s. The one that was made the latest is the silver one, which is the wine cooler that sits on the table. And that's around 1820. And it's Georgian Sheffield plate wine cooler. All of these items are at the Georgian house. My, my my dear friend Fran Underhill, she she has a penchant for champagne buckets and ice coolers like that, so I'll be sure to share that with her. Very nice. Well, fantastic. Thank you for that. Okay, stop share, and um, there we go. So last of the questions. So who was I asked for the quiz? Was Andy asked for the quiz? Andy. Andy, Andy, Andy. Wasn't much of a quiz, really, was it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a ten-second uh, quiz. It, I, I, why is there a stigma on rosé? The quiz thing has, has popped off the screen. So we're back to Vince. Uh, so this going along the line of our rescue package we did a few months ago. Did you do a rescue package a few months ago, Charles and Ruth? No, oh, no, we did, though. I mean, the government gave us a bunch of money. Is Excuse that me. what you're talking about? I guess it is from Vince. Excuse me, Vince. Yeah. So, Antonia, is that right? What's he asking? So this going along the line of our rescue package we did a few months ago. 
not sure what he means, but yes, the government gave the NTS some money um, to help. We made almost half of the, oh gosh, about half of the staff redu um, not redundant on furlough, and and then well, actually, it was more than that. And then there was a threat of almost, I think it was seventy percent of the staff being made redundant, and that went down down to a third of the staff. Um, and then there's money money came in from the culture department. Um, and we're building a strategy, a resilient strategy now. Plus, we're opening up our properties now, lots of outside properties and some inside properties. Georgian House is open, for example, as is Gladstone's Land. Yes. We're having trouble hiring people because of the furlough system and the hospitality trade is, is actually experiencing this across the board. Mm. So we have some a very high number of uh, jobs. So if anybody wants a job in National Trust property, go to our website and go to the job page because there's lots of jobs Great. which is kind of crazy after the year we've had yeah no indeed it is a strange state of affairs but anyway, i'm glad i'm glad we reached on that and then final question of the year is uh what is the simpsons view on wine boxes in terms of reducing weight so we finish on a sustainability piece which basically is what brings naked wines together with National Trust for Scotland and, <laughs> and nice. artists. So listen, I, I think I'm uh, totally open to wine boxes um, and wine boxes is, is another uh, type of wine that's had stigma over the years. And it's funny when you look around the world is, is how various countries have adopted it. I mean, the Scandinavians absolutely love wine boxes because it's the sort of thing they all have cabins and so they have one have something they can throw on their shoulder and walk through um you know the the, the snow with their snowshoes on and, and carry you know copious amount of wine for, for the weekend so you know the the what what has given wine boxes a bad name is because in this country you put cheap wine into it but guess what you don't have to put cheap wine into it um the technology has moved on big time as well in terms of the cleanliness and the ability and the way in which you use um inert gases like nitrogen to to um bottle into them um, so that the preservation you know is, is really really good so I think it has a role to play um, but it you know it, it's more for a home environment I think you know in fine dining people are always going to want to have the sommelier bring the, the wine and pull the cork and pour it to you versus bringing this bag and but hey why not right you know I've got no problem with it no stigma you just have to make the boxes more sexy Mm. Well, that's that's then that is what is happening, and uh, yes, yes. and, and there, there's a nice movement happening. Shout out to our friends at Lalo, the two Lauras. You yes, yeah. yeah, I was going to say Laura. Yeah. And then a, a, a sneak, yeah, a leak. Let's say uh, with naked wines and and where we and when we know our responsibility and, and basically not responsibility. That's the wrong way of saying it. When we are all eco freaks we are very very environmentally driven passionately independently and we just have this very fortunate position that we're able to make calls like this but you can expect to see more boxed wine on naked but on the premium level because that's where as you said charles it has a stigma around the the, the cheaper entry level but as, and again as you say antonia packaging must be beautiful because it's going to yeah and i mean also what about or... decanters you know you you can use decanters they seem to have gone out of fashion for some reason and why not why not go down that route so you can have your big box of wine in the kitchen with your butler and then you just decant it into a lovely beautiful yeah 20 quid a year i'll, I'll have a book really? absolutely well there you go um, and and Tony, where can people go? Do they need to visit the website to see exactly what's open? Yeah, so every individual property is different. So if you're going to Aberdeenshire, just go in and find the Aberdeenshire properties. Some interiors are open, many are not. Most gardens are open, and obviously all the big landscapes are, are open. But there are some interiors, there are some houses that you can get into. But check the website for dates and times because they vary enormously. Super. Okay, well, thank you very much, guys. It was it was absolutely fantastic. It's probably the least amount I've ever spoken on one of these Thursday Tuesdays because <laughs> the content was just there naturally, and I and I lapped it up and I drank some wine and had a very nice evening. Yeah. It was lovely, delicious thank wine. Thank you so. much. This, this is delicious. This red wine is my favorite <laughs> of the lot. Thank you. <laughs> fantastic. Thank, you thank you, Charles and Ruth, for for sharing your wines and and your background, Ruth and Antonia. The fantastic info that you shared. I mean, it was, it was really no problem. Been a joy. I'm starved of history and culture and this this was a 
a, a gem of an evening. Thank you very much. And everyone who's attended, thank you very much. And we'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm. See you Bye. soon, everyone. Good luck, guys. See you Take soon. Care. Bye. 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 Bye.